bike on here. Anyway, uh, I felt that this would be the best uh, format to do this show would be to go to a Reform and Conforming Live. I think I've done one Reform and Conforming Live before. Um, I'm not sure if I've done any others. But I'm doing this one because I felt that it would be best to address this instead of going on the core issues podcast where I kind of speak to everybody. I'm really speaking specifically to my reformed Calvinistic and or brothers and sisters, however you want to label yourselves. Um, but those who are soteriologically reformed or Calvinistic, those who believe in the five uh, doctrines of grace, the five points of what we call the tulip. <clears throat> and I want to address that because it is an issue where we want to make sure that we are biblically accurate in what we do. And I'm so speaking specifically to those brothers and sisters um, that are going out and they consider themselves to be reformed or Calvinistic and they are handing out gospel tracts or, and, or they may be writing gospel tracts. And I want to make sure that as we go out and do this, we do this rightly. And I know that earlier on in my, um, Christian walk, I was less concerned about gospel tracts, about gospel signs. One time I was actually up in, uh, Seattle doing some uh, street ministry up there with a group of people from a evangelism conference and Cy Ten Bruggenkate was there with us and I love brother Cy and he is such an encouragement he's been such a help to me over the years but he saw this sign I was holding and the sign said Jesus died for your sins you know was buried was seen saved my life you know and all that but it said died for your sins or died for our sins one of the two and he looked at me he goes you know your sign's an Arminian sign <laughs> and I said I know it's not my sign I just he says do you know if the pastor's okay with you and I said oh yeah he's cool with it and uh and I was like, okay, cool. But, you know, I just took it down because I was like, I don't, don't want controversy. It didn't, I, I knew it kind of, I knew, okay, that's not very accurate. But you may be thinking, you may be thinking even reformed here, Calvinistic, and you're wondering, well, what's wrong with that? Well, a as you're reformed, I think you would know that. But let me just ask you this question. If you hold to the five tenets, five uh, points of Calvinism, as it were, do you believe that everybody on the earth is elect? Even more specific, do you believe that every single person you give a track to or hold up a sign for someone to see, that only the elect see it, only the elect read it, only the elect receive that track? I would venture to guess that you don't believe that. I would venture to guess that you were like Spurgeon would say, I don't know who the elect are. If God said the elect had a yellow stripe painted down their back, I'd go around lifting up shirt tails rather than preaching the gospel. But since uh, that hasn't happened, that's not what he does. I will continue to preach the gospel. And so there we are preaching the gospel through preaching, tracting signs, whatever it is. We're proclaiming Christ's message to the world. And when we do that, we want to do that accurately. And sadly, though Reformed Calvinistic friends don't believe they're handing out gospel tracts to only the elect, don't believe that they're preaching to only the elect, yet speak to people, sometimes in their preaching, but definitely in their gospel tracts, as if they are speaking to the elect. Now you may say, okay, what's the problem with that? Well, number one, the number one problem is it's not biblical. Remember, we're trying to be biblical. Number one, the Bible does not speak to people in the ways that these tracts speak to people. And definitely not in the way it speaks to the non-elect, as it speaks to specifically the elect of the church, those who have been saved by Jesus Christ. Now, for any Armenian um, synergistic brother or sister maybe watching this, um, I have never had one of them be upset with one of the tracks I've written based on the language I used, because the language I use is biblical. They can't complain about it. They don't complain about it. They don't see it as a problem. They never, never said a word to me about tracks that I've written with the language that I use because it's not in any way detracting from a call to repentance, not in any way hindering someone from uh, receiving the message and coming to Christ. It just does not use unbiblical language that non-reformed tracks tend to use. And the problem is here is I'm going to read to you some tracks, some lines from some tracks. And what's really problematic about these is that they're written by people who would call themselves reformed or Calvinistic. And they're using language that is not in that vein. Um, so let me, let me go before I get into, let me get into like kind of basic three levels of tracks from bad to good. Okay. You've got bad tracks that are all full of craziness, just all kinds of unbiblical stuff. 
you know, they may use Bible verses and use all this stuff, but they don't call people to repentance. They just tell people Jesus loves them. Um, and then they get you to say the sinner's prayer and they try to affirm you that if you said the sinner's prayer, you know, you're going to heaven. All those are bad tracks. Those are bad tracks. We don't want to use those. And I think most reform guys know we don't want to use those. But then there's these tracks that are in the middle that are better, but they're still soteriologically inaccurate. And again, you may have asked, well, what's the problem with speaking to the non-elect like they're elect? Well, it should be very simple. But if you haven't come to this conclusion, I want to help you out here. If you speak to someone not knowing that they are elect and you make them a promise about what Christ has done for them and you don't know that they're elect, you are potentially lying to that person. You don't know because, again, you don't know that they're elect or not. But if they're not elect, you have lied to them. And we don't want to be liars. So we have to make sure if you tell someone that Christ has done something for them in that tract or in that conversation, and you don't know that they are one of the elect, when again, none of us knows that, then you are misleading them. You are lying, or at least potentially. And we don't want to do that. And the key thing is we don't have to do that. So these middle of the road tracks use language that is not intended for the non-elect. And therefore, since we don't know who's the elect, we don't want to tell them and treat everybody as if they're elect. We want to treat them as the Bible treats lost people. We want to call them to repentance. We want to tell them what Christ did for sinners. Generic term, which we all fit under. And that's why uh, non-reform non folks, non calvinists people don't have a problem with using language because it's biblical. But we don't make things specific. Remember, a lot of the verses that speak to people specifically, like Romans 5, 8 and others, where we're talking about you and us and, you know, those type of things. Remember, these are all written in epistles to the church, to the people of God. So let me read uh, just a few of these lines, and, and hopefully you'll see the problem with these. And remember, these are tracts written by Reformed Calvinistic people. Uh our supposed good works will profit us nothing. I'm just reading the middle of a paragraph. Here's the, here's the sentence. The good news of the gospel is that God loves you and has made a way for you to escape his own wrath. Does God love the non-elect? Now, I know there's debates about that, and but we're talking about salvific love. This is about seeing them saved. We, as those who hold to the soteriological points of Calvinism, do not believe that saving love has been given to the non-elect. And since we do not know that they are saved, we should not tell them that God loves them. And, that's, and we surely shouldn't call that the good news because it isn't the good news. It's tied up in the love of God, of course, but it's in God's glorifying himself and his son, the triune Godhead, in saving a people for his glory and for our good in love. There's so much more to it than love, even in saving the elect, of course. That's not the key. That, that's not the good news of the gospel. <laughs> the good news is focused on God, not about us. Secondarily, about us. I know it's hard to believe, but that's really the focus. So whenever you hear someone say God loves you, I also ask you, is it biblical? That's the key thing. Again, well, all this is it biblical. When you go and look at Bibles, you read through the Bible, do you see anything where God says, God loves you? Anytime a preacher, Jesus, or anybody says, God loves you. Why do people love John 3, 16 so much? Because it says God so loved the world. Because it talks about the love of God for humanity. That's, that, it's amazing. It is awesome. It's true. God is love. I'm not detracting from that. But I'm just saying, you don't see. Jesus never says, hey, I love you. Come hear me. I love you. Let me tell you about my salvation. He doesn't talk that way. The apostles don't say, hey, Jesus loves you. God loves you, and here's his plan for your life. They don't speak that way, so we shouldn't speak that way. Another gospel track. You've heard this one before, probably heard this from um, several places. Um, I will tell you that this track is not from Ray Comfort, even though the language would be directly probably from one of his tracks, but it is actually from a Reformed Brothers uh, website, and his tracks Someone comes in, pays your fine. You've know, heard the story about the judge, you're found guilty, and there's been fine. So they come in to fa pay your fine. It says, so they pay the fine, and you're free to go. And he said, I'll start with this sentence. How would that make you feel? And this, here's the key. That's what Jesus did for you 
2,000 years ago. He paid the penalty for your sins by dying on the cross. As a soteriologically reformed person, as a um, Calvinistic believer holding to the five points of Calvinism, would you tell somebody in a conversation that Jesus died for you? Jesus died for your sins on the cross 2,000 years ago. Jesus paid your fine. If you do, you could be lying. You're potentially lying to them because he did not pay for the sins of the non-elect. And we do not want to lie. So every time that we speak with this type of language to a non-believer, since we do not know they're elect, we are potentially lying to them and undoubtedly have lied to several people throughout our lives. We don't want to do that. Not even... Uh, unconsciously, subconsciously. Uh, this one. This was, uh, I'll use his name here because he's dead now, and so it's not, but it'll show you how big a guy, how a big theological brain this is. A guy who wrote a big, a great little mini theological, soteriologically sound book on salvation called, um, oh, what is it? Uh, I think it's called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God by J.I. Packer. This is J.I. Packer. This is a little tract sold by J.I. Packer. I'm becoming a Christian. It's sold by Crossway. And then I went through all the Crossway tracts, even by, uh, I won't name the names, but reform folks, and they throw in bad language. Not cussing, but improper language. But let me, let me tell you exactly what J.I. Packer said here. Uh, born of Virgin Mary through the Holy Spirit, God's son, whose human name is Jesus, lived a perfect life died a criminal's death as a sacrifice for your sins and rose again from the grave to rule as Christ. Okay, again, this tract, you're handed this person, and you're saying that Jesus died for your sins. If you don't know their elect, you are potentially lying to them. And again, that's not how the Bible speaks to lost people about their, their sins being forgiven. He speaks to his people. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. That's it. And he did. He effectively saved them. Remember, we believe that. That there's limited atonement and it is effective reconciliation with God through the work of Christ on the cross. It has been effected. It has been actuated. It has been perfected on the cross. There's no more work for us to do. Now, there's a lot of good, well-written gospel tracts by theologically reformed folks. And I could go through a bunch of them. I have tried to help um, one brother with his site correct all of the distractions and some new ones have gotten in and maybe not got uh, everything or I might have missed one or two lines on a couple. But uh, overall, they're all solid. But if you're writing tracks, brothers, we want to make sure that they are soteriologically accurate. So let me give you some ideas of how you can change these very simply. Because you might be going, well, how do I make a change so that it's accurate then? So it's right that I'm not potentially lying to somebody. Really simple. Let me take J.I. Packer's... Um, statement here and edit it real quickly, real easily, um, so that this would be then an accurate, soteriologically accurate, biblical tract that no even non-reformed person should have a problem handing out. So let's see, Jesus lived a perfect life, died a criminal's death as a sacrifice for sinners. Just that simple. When you say for sinners, of course, that means ultimately, you know, everybody in the world's a sinner outside of Christ. But it doesn't specify them. It doesn't say to the sinner, you, you, Christ died on the cross for you. It doesn't say this. He died for sinners. What sinners? Well, the sinners that have been elect from before the foundation of the world. The sinners who repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. By writing, going from your sins to sinners, it becomes soteriologically, biblically accurate. You're not potentially lying to people. And they can still ask that question. What sinners? And they should ask that question. And if they get more questions to ask you, the, these good tracks, of course, show that they're sinners. So they can know that they could be saved by this because they're a sinner. But it isn't us telling them that you have had your penalty paid for by Christ. It leaves it ambiguous and general. And that's the key. It's general because that's how Scripture speaks of it in terms. General when it's not speaking directly to sinners that are saved by grace through Christ that are the elect. So... Very simple. Make it general, make it non-specific, and then therefore you are not potentially lying to somebody. So again, here's J.I. Packer's version. Died a criminal's death 
death as a sacrifice for your sins. A soteriological and biblically accurate statement. Died a criminal's death as a sacrifice for sinners. Just that simple. Let's go to this other brother's track from this other website. How would that make you feel? That's what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago. That's their line. Again, saying specifically to the person you're handing the track that you do not know is elect or not, you are saying that it was a general atonement. You are saying this is a an atoning work that Christ did on the cross is a universal potential atonement, just like our Arminian synergistic brothers and sisters. You are making an unbiblical and a soteriologically un-Calvinistic, unreformed statement that what Jesus Christ did for you 2,000 years ago was wrong. So how do we change it? Again, very simple, very simple edit. That's what Jesus did for sinners 2,000 years ago. See how, see, see how simple that is? That's what Jesus did for sinners 2,000 years ago. Or you can even be specific and you can say that's what Jesus did for his people 2,000 years ago. The Bible defines who his people are, and they're going to have to do some searching to see if that's them. And most tracts even deal to some degree about who his people are, those who repent and trust in Christ. So if you just want to keep it general, simple, biblical, just say Jesus Christ died for sinners instead of died for you or died for us. Us and you, again, when you say us, you're bringing them into us. You're bringing them into the church. You're bringing them into the elect because we're obviously elect. We got saved, right? We're part of the church. So when we say us, we're saying that for the sinner out there who I don't know, we're saying definitely Christ died for you. And that's a soteriologically uninformed statement and possibly a lie. So say Jesus Christ died for sinners. And then you got a great track. Third and final track. I wouldn't deal with God loves you at all. I just wouldn't have that in there. I'd say the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Like the apostle Paul, I'd use that type of verse. I would say that Jesus Christ came and he saved his people from his sins. But you can talk about love. You can put John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Being biblically accurate, quoting scripture. Or you can put something like, the good news is that God loved his people so much that he sent his son to save them from their sins. You can have the love of God there for his people and be very accurate. But saying to them again, God loves you. God died for you. God died for us or God died for everyone is unbiblical, soteriologically inaccurate language. So I want to encourage my brothers. Like I said, I didn't want to make this too terribly long. I wanted to encourage my brothers and sisters that the tracks that you hand out, the tracks that you use as you're going um, door to door, as you're going to events, make sure that the tracks that you use are soteriologically accurate. So as I am um, been doing this video, is it, am I not even streaming? Yes, I says I'm live. It says I have zero viewers. There we go. And so, yep, it's still working. So anyway, just wanted to make that clear. I think I made it clear there as I put that out. So hopefully this will be a help to some people. Remember that as you buy tracks, as you write tracks, as you give tracks away, make sure that your tracks are soteriologically and biblically accurate. And that way we are not lying to people. We are not misleading people and we are being faithful to the scripture. So anyway, again, that was my video. Hope that's a help to you. If you have any questions about where you can find some really good tracks that are soteriologically and biblically accurate, um, get a hold of me. I'd be happy to point you to them. And um, if you have questions, you're writing a track. Maybe you're putting a track together and you like would like to know um, how to maybe, maybe you're having trouble getting a language towards something like that. Let me know. I'd be happy to help you out. It's usually really simple, like I already showed you. But I'd be happy to do that. I've helped uh, quite a few uh, tracks get set up that way. And I always try to write mine in that vein. And uh, like I said, I think it's pretty simple, but if you have any questions, please get a hold of me. Get a hold of me on Facebook, send me a private message, or I'll reach out if you know me closer by uh, phone or whatever. Anyway, God bless you, brothers, sisters. Have a great night, and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Bye now.